Let me just tell you a couple quick words about him and then I will kick it over to the treasurer. Um, Michael Frerichs was born in Gifford, Illinois, which according to Wikipedia has a population of 911. Um, uh, it's in Champaign County. Um, grew up there, um, uh, went to Yale University. Uh, then he went, spent two years in Taiwan teaching English returned to Champaign, uh, created a technology company, has been involved in local politics, the Champaign County Board, and served as Champaign's county auditor, a volunteer firefighter, among other things. He was elected to the Illinois State Senate in 2006 and went on to serve as chairman of the Higher Education Committee and also the Agriculture Committee. And he was elected treasurer in 2014 and has been reelected two times. Um, and he's also the president of the Bipartisan National Association of State Auditors, Comptrollers, and Treasurers. And the treasurer's office manages $52 billion. So it's a really important uh, financial player in Illinois. And with that, I'll turn it over to the treasurer. Great. Thank you very much. So thank you guys for coming, coming by. Uh, I am a politician. I could talk for a while. But I find groups uh, appreciate more when I talk about things you would like to hear about. So hopefully you were thinking about questions. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of my office. And then feel free to ask questions about my office, about my career, uh, personal questions. I don't mind taking them. Uh, state government, politics, whatever. Um, be ready to ask away and this will be fun. Uh, but briefly. People ask me all the time, what is it you do? So well, I'm a state treasurer. Well, what does a state treasurer do? I said, well, I'm the chief investment officer. I invest the state's money. And people would, for years, would say, yeah, but you work for a state that has no money. What do you do all day? You dust the vault for cobwebs? Now, there was a period there where the state did not have enough money in our general revenue fund, and we weren't paying bills, and when it appears without budget. But the state has over 700 different funds with fund balances. We invest that money, we try and make more money for the state because every dollar we can make in interest earnings is a dollar that doesn't have to be raised in taxes, or a dollar in cuts that don't have to be made to things like our schools, our roads, our bridges, our universities. And there was a period there where there were a lot of cuts for universities. So that's the most important part of my job. But I say that I also get really excited about giving people the tools they need to invest in themselves. Now, everyone wants a brighter future for themselves and for their children. So we run two college savings programs, 529 programs, to help people save, uh, send their kids to school. We started a retirement savings program so people can have a retirement with dignity, so they can enjoy their golden years. We found kids with disabilities really were limited in their future because of federal rules on how much you could have in terms of assets and still get federal benefits. We set up a program, ABLE, that's made it uh, a lot easier for parents to leave more money for their children. We're charged of financial literacy. We help businesses through a variety of investment programs, our Illinois Growth and Innovation Fund. Uh, happy to talk about our Ag Invest program or a new program we have, our Infrastructure Investment Fund. There are a lot of different things we do, but quite frankly, one of the most fun things I get to do is I get to play Santa Claus 365 days a year. Just giving away money. We've given, over, given out nearly $2 billion to people and businesses in the state of Illinois. Uh, we've done things differently. We worked in a bipartisan manner to make change, to make it easier to get their money, and we're giving out a lot. And that is very good because I know that when we put more money into your pockets, you are likely to spend it at a local business. Or maybe if it's 50 bucks, you say, hey, let's go out to eat at a local restaurant. And that money being spent and circulated throughout the local economy does a lot more good for the state than does sitting in a bank account in Springfield. And so I will tell people I have the best job in state government. Other politicians may tell you they have the best job in state government, but they'd be lying to you. Because <laughs> literally, I make money, a lot of money for the state, that is fun. I help people make money so that they can live their own version of the American dream, and I give away money every day. These are all fun things. So with that, I can show you out of the office. Um, I know you have a few questions, but think about if you have questions for me, my background, some more specific questions on programs in my office, happy to go into more detail if you're interested. Well, yeah, I'll just have a couple quick questions, and I really encourage all of you to jump in. We had an event with the comptroller, and one moment she got very passionate when I asked her about legislation that would merge the comptroller's office and the treasurer's office. Yeah. Why don't you briefly describe the, di the, the different functions of the two offices and, and why it's important that they're distinct offices? 
Well, I will merge, I'll tell you the, the difference between the offices, but then I will give you a different answer than the comptroller about these emerging offices. Um, so um, think of it, the, uh, the treasurer takes in money along with the Department of Revenue, and before we have to spend that money, we invest it. So just think like, uh, you know in Illinois there are two seasons. There's a winter and construction season. Okay, so our infrastructure, our road fund is paid for with a lot of um, gas tax money. And people drive throughout the winter, but there's no construction going on there. That money comes in, but we're not paying it out. While it's sitting in the fund, we invest it and try to make more so that we can fund more miles of road projects during construction season. Okay, so I just, now when the money needs to go out, the comptroller is in charge of writing the checks. So there are checks and balances there. So the comptroller will tell you that it's very important that we have these checks and balances, you don't merge the two offices, because there is something to that. You, know, you can't give um, one person all the powers of the purse, it's too easy to, uh, to abscond with money. And the example I like to give people is, I never understood this as a, as a kid, Back when people went to movie theaters, I think we're getting back into that. When they went to movie theaters, how do you get into a theater? Pay for a ticket. You pay for a ticket and then you walk right on in, right? Because there's another step involved. Then you give, give it to a ticket checker. Okay, now if you want to be really efficient, why do you pay two people to do this? Anyone? Everybody paid to, come in. to make sure they paid to come in. Because what they found is there's one person in charge of letting people in. Uh, it's very easy to say, hey, you're my friends. Just, just walk on in. Just go on in and not charge you. But that ticket taker on the other side is a check and balance. If you walk by me without buying a ticket, they say, no, no. And um, the, ticket, the ticket checker, if they had friends or something, you know, they have to... Um, uh, rectify receipts in a day, the number of tickets sold, number of tickets, tickets collected. And if they're just letting their funds in, their friends in, it, it presents it presents problems. Anyway, so there's checks and balances. So the comptroller would tell you you need a treasurer and a comptroller to stop money from being stolen, like that happened under Orville Hodge. Orville Hodge, back in the 1950s, he was auditor of public accounts, stole something like five million dollars in state funds. Uh, but what I would say is there was a state treasurer back then. That wasn't the check and balance. The state, the balance came when we, uh, in our 1970 constitution, created the office of auditor general. Now the auditor makes sure that money doesn't go missing. The auditor conducts audits. And so I think that like, yes, you need checks and balances, but you don't necessarily need an elected comptroller, an elected treasurer. You could merge some of those responsibilities and then segregate incompatible responsibilities and put them in the Auditor General's office, put them in the Governor's office, you could put them in the Secretary of State's office. It's really up to the public in my mind. If the public wants to merge these two offices, we can do it in a way that is responsible. If the public says, nope, we like having multiple elected officials and we think that's a good use of money, then we'll work with the system they give us. So yeah, she feels very strongly <laughs> against merging. I think leave it up to the public. If the public want to decide, we will work to make sure we do this in the most efficient way possible, find the greatest savings, and I could be supportive of that. Okay. One more question, then I'm going to turn to you. Now, you've been, you served in the, the Illinois Sen State Senate. What is the difference in terms of just kind of day-to-day -day work, responsibilities, sense of achievement being in the Senate versus a constitutional officer as treasurer? Okay. There's a lot, lot to unpack there. Sense of achievement, um, and both are very rewarding. Um, I think a big difference is, as a member of the legislature, every law comes in front of you. And so if you're someone who is immensely curious, like you can dive into anything. If you're interested in infrastructure or transportation, you can get on the transportation committee. If you're interested in, so in, uh, in criminal justice, there's a justice committee, a judiciary committee. Maybe health care is your thing. Maybe education is your thing. Maybe higher education is your thing. Like, if you like all of these things, you can involve yourself and pass legislation in a bunch of different ways. As treasurer, I'm a little more limited in what my sphere is. But as a former legislator, I will tell you, I'm only limited by what state statute tells me I can do. And I have friends in the Senate and the House that we repeatedly go back and say, hey, you know, we think we could do a better job making money for the state if you change state statute. We think we could do a better job returning money to people if you just make these tweaks to state law. And so I actually really like this because 
as an executive, it is more rewarding because I get to do things. Legislators get to set guardrails and have budgets. Uh, the example I use, if you're a legislator, if you're a legislator and you um, conceive an idea, okay, conceive an idea, but then you've got to like get it drafted, you've got to go find uh, someone to write this, to research this, you get it uh, filed, you get it assigned to committee, you've got to get a majority of votes to that committee, and then it goes to the full house, the full senate, and you've got to get a majority of votes there. And then it goes on to the other chamber, and it goes through committee there, it goes to the full chamber there, then it goes on to the governor, and from the time of conception to the time it is born as a law, it can take about nine months. It's an awful lot like um, giving birth to children. It takes a while, it's hard, <laughs> painful at times, it can keep you up at night. Um, you do this, but then after your idea is born, and it is law in the state, then you turn it over to someone else who adopts it and raises it because it's the executive branch that's in charge of enforcing laws. So what I found is, is like, you know, that was my legislation, but then someone else gets to raise and implement it. I didn't like that. We get to um, raise our children in the treasurer's office. We work with General Assembly to pass ideas, but then we get to set them up. And also, when I get an idea, I don't have to go to, generally, I don't have to go to uh, 60 members of the House and convince them that my idea is good. And I don't have to go to 30 members of the Senate and convince them that my idea is good. When we decided we wanted to make a change in our provider for our college savings funds, when I had conversation with them, it's clear they didn't want to market to lower income uh, families and uh, families of color. I fired them. That's, a legislator can't just do that. We made changes, we hired someone new being executive, uh, to me, is more fun. Okay, great. Questions? Yes, good uh, to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. Uh, so in the past couple of years, the budget for town of infrastructure, road work, IDOT specifically, has hugely increased. Yes. And I'm a civil engineering major, really happy to see that, because I think we needed it. But my question is, why didn't it happen earlier? So I think it happened because the General Assembly passed a capital bill. And um, so when I was in the Senate, we passed one soon after Governor Blagojevich was out of office. Now, we didn't pass one for years because Governor Blagojevich couldn't be trusted with large pots of money. <laughs> it's true. I mean, before he, was, before he was arrested, there were leaders in General Assembly said, if we give this man $10 billion to spend on infrastructure projects, he is going to like shake down contractors uh, to get contributions and charge, uh, charge this. He's gonna play political favorites, they couldn't trust him. We got a new governor in, we passed uh, a capital bill. That money was spent, there were infrastructure needs that had to happen. Governor Rauner was governor, and Governor Rauner's higher interest was breaking unions. <laughs> Want to make Illinois a right to work state. <clears throat> and so, uh, because that was his higher priority rather than building infrastructure, the General Assembly wasn't going to give him a package that he would then use say, okay, you only get money if you're hiring non-union uh, workers out there. And so that's why it didn't happen. When Governor Pritzker came in, there was an alignment finally, like, hey, we also agree that you need to spend here. There was a trust that the money would be allocated uh, fairly, that you wouldn't have a governor holding up projects. I mean, this has happened in Illinois before. Governors held up projects well, we're not going to fund that uh, interchange in Champaign County until you vote for my bill. That's not how it should work. If you don't have trust between legislators, the legislature's not going to give the governor a cudgel to hold over their heads. So that's why I think it didn't happen before. Not that there wasn't a need, there just needs to be trust and resources uh, committed to, to raising it. Yes? I also have an infrastructure related question. Okay. Um, the Carroll Port project has been going on for for a while now, and yep. from what I've read, you know, it's been paused. I think it's in its second installment. Do you know what's going on with that? Not not much. So uh, I'll tell you two things. I'm very concerned with it, but the money for that doesn't come out of the treasurer's office. It's not at this point an investable asset. But there's an issue there of trust as well. There were people who were backers of this who were spending a lot of money on some things that legislators thought, like, well, is that really important for the project or is this uh, self-aggrandizing? I don't know what the answer is. I've not been involved in that, but I know that lack of trust has impeded uh, investments in that area. 
But what we can do is I saw that there are companies investing in infrastructure. There are ma money managers investing in infrastructure and making money off of this. And I said, well, why can't the state of Illinois invest in infrastructure? I mean, we'd like to have more infrastructure in the state, built, repaired, uh, grown. We'd like to make money off of it. Why can't we do it? And the answer was, the lawyers turned me and said, well, because you're not allowed to. Why am I not allowed to? Well, it's, it's not in state statute. You don't have permission to do that. I was a former legislator. My answer is, well, then great. We just need to change state statute. Now, the General Assembly is um, happy with the investment returns we make. We've made over $2.3 billion in investment earnings. And when I tell them that, they say, well, that's good. That's $2.3 billion we don't have to raise in taxes. Thank you. But I will tell you that they are all a risk-averse body. That if I um, showed up and lost $1,000 next year, they'd be far angrier than the $2.3 billion we've earned. How could you lose $1,000? I mean, like, I get it. If you're not a gambler, and I'm, and I'm not, we're, we're risk averse. We don't, we don't want to lose money. We'd like to make money. We really hate losing money. And so I wasn't allowed to because these investments can be somewhat risky. But I went and made the argument to them, like, allow me to invest up to 5% of the state portfolio in infrastructure. <coughs> We're able to do that because, one, it's only 5%. If you lost all of it, which is not going to happen, you know, you're only losing 5% of your portfolio and, portfolio and other investments will, will balance it out. We'll probably make money. We'll get a good rate of return because many, many other people are doing this. Um, and then, two, we'll promise to invest in Illinois and attract additional dollars into Illinois doing it. So not only will we make money for the state, if we put people to work here in Illinois, um, they're going to pay more in income taxes. And if we improve our roads, our bridges, our uh, water, our utilities, uh, our communications, that's going to help our businesses grow and thrive as well. So it's sort of like a win-win-win for the state. And we were able to convince them. And so now we've set this up. And we're the first state in the country to use treasury dollars to invest in infrastructure. And I think it's going to be a, a good win. And other states are going to follow. Other states have already reached out to us and asked how we did it. Could I ask a broader budget question yeah. about Illinois? I mean, we hear different things. Some people say, you know, there have been a couple of credit upgrades and things are on the right track. Others say, well, it's just kind of a sugar high because of a lot of federal money that came during COVID. What is your assessment of the broad budget situation in Illinois? Okay, so I would say it's not just a sugar high because of COVID. The federal government spending helped states, not just Illinois, helped lots of states. But um, the credit rating upgrades are a sign that we are moving in the right direction. It's clear they don't just hand these out like candy on Halloween. Uh, we earned these. I think we probably earned more credit upgrades based on the work of the General Assembly and the governor over the last four years. Um, so that's great. We're going in the right direction. But if people start celebrating, saying like, well, hey, then let's go on a spending spree. <laughs> we're, all, we're all good. We are not out of the, the forest yet. You know, we were digging a hole. The credit upgrades say that we have stopped digging. We have started filling in the hole, but we're not out of the hole yet. Several more years of filling in the hole, and then we will be in a much better place. So I think if we continue to do what we've been doing, uh, spending less than we're taking in, being responsible about our investments that help grow our economy, Illinois has a great future. Um, but it, now is no time to spike, spike the football. You know, we've gone from like the uh, the, uh, our end zone to the 20-yard line. That's, that's good. We still have another 80 yards to go before we can celebrate with a touchdown. With regard to the money that you return, uh, how does the treasurer come into to possession of those funds? And is there a certain point when those are no longer available to return? No, so they are always available. We will hold them in perpetuity. So if you don't claim your money, your children or heirs can claim your money. If they don't claim your money, their children and heirs can claim your money 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Now, eventually, it becomes really difficult to track down after certain years. And so the state will hold on to it. The state will invest it. We'll invest it in our pension funds. But if your great-grandchildren come and can provide a copy of your will <coughs> and your child's will and your grandchildren's will that shows they are the heir to you, we'll pay it out 70, 80 years from now. How does it come into our possession? Um, no, I think there were companies out there that were really smart. They wanted to make money. They owed money to people. And they would write a check and mail it off. And that check wasn't cashed. They're like, well, I guess they don't want their money. We'll, we'll keep it. 
And uh, because they felt they could get away with that, I think uh, some checks were sent to the wrong address. Mm -hmm. Oh well, we mailed it, they didn't cash it. Or I can tell you what some companies were doing is uh, they would pay an outside firm to pay their bills, to write their checks. Doesn't that sound inefficient? I'm like, I mean, you're gonna pay someone else to pay your bills. Why would they do that? Well, that's what you get to there. Um, they would do it, so like, let's say uh, company X offered a rebate, okay? And so you go into company X's store, and it says $100 off a new cell phone, and you're like, well, that sounds like a great deal. Time to buy a new cell phone. You buy the cell phone, and it says $500 on the uh, on price, and so you get up there and they say $500. Oh, no, no, it's $100 off. It's only $400. Oh, no, no, no. Not a, not a, you pay $500 today, and then we'll give you your receipt, and then we'll give you this form to fill out. And it's this big, and you've got to write lots of little things in there. And then we're going to give you this, uh, this card. We'll see the address where you'd mail it. And we're going to shove it all in the bag, and here you go. Go home, fill it out. What do you think happens with most of those rebate funds? They get thrown out. They get thrown out. They count on that. They entice you in the door. But if you don't follow through, you're not entitled to that money. Those are the rules. But a lot of people were filling out those forms, mailing them in. And we're waiting six to eight weeks to get their $100 check. And they waited, and they waited. The check never came, and they're like, oh, well, not 100 bucks. <clears throat> they did their part. They were owed that money. Why didn't they get their check? Because company X was not writing checks to people. Company X hired company Y to write those checks. And so you're going to the mailbox every day looking for a check from company X, you never see it. Meanwhile, company Y that goes by the name ABC Global mails you that check. What do you do when you get a letter in the mail from ABC Global uh, Finance? Junk mail. Junk mail, throw it out. This was the scam. This was their plan. You, um, they know you're likely to throw it away and that company then gets to keep that money. Except we have consumer protection laws. We run a consumer protection uh, office. So we send auditors to those companies and say, hey, you owed checks to these people. They didn't cash it. You either have to find them and get them to cash check, or you turn the money over to us. State law allows us to do that. We enforce it through audits. We enforce it through lawsuits. Uh, company X, I'm not going to mention the name because we eventually reached an agreement. And part of the agreement was I wouldn't badmouth Company X. <laughs> company X existed. <laughs> And, uh, and they gave us a settlement and then turned over millions of dollars to us. And then we were able to track down the people who threw away their checks because they looked like junk mail. So that's a fun part of my job. We get to give away money. We also get to fight with bad companies, bad actors who aren't paying out money they should. Yes? Um, this is a new one, but um, um, with regards to the community development block grants, um, I know I'm, this is more maybe of a question for the Office of Community Development. Probably. Um, Okay, but hold on. I just want to see from like an economic some kind of standpoint. Like, is there um, kind of a an example um, a city or community that has really used those funds really, really well, and you know, to to um, make upgrades to infrastructure, redevelop community, like dilapidated neighborhoods, just so that in Southern Illinois too, we could yeah. use those as models for how we too in some of these food deserts and everything like that can kind of rebuild and everything. My answer is gonna be unsatisfying. Okay. I don't really know. Okay. I'm sure I'm sure there are, but because we don't administer them, I don't hear the stories as okay. much. And uh, and I'll tell you I've got a relatively small office. Mm -hmm. 180 employees. Compared to some other state agencies we're not that big. But we oversee fifty two billion dollars. There's a lot that I have to manage. Mm -hmm. And so I don't spend the time like looking at other um, state agencies, like maybe my curiosity might want me to. It's like if it's not my responsibility, I don't have, I don't have time for it. So I'm sure they're good examples, but um, the governor's office is probably a better mm -hmm. a better place for that. We we try to work with. We know that like we can leverage dollars. We can work with the Illinois Finance Authority on things and find ways to work <coughs> together. But community development block grants they don't really include us so much. Sorry. Do you have, are there laws or rules out there that, that prevent you from doing your job as, as well as you could probably do it? You know, you, you mentioned a trust law, right? I used to 
spend the university money and things. But uh, yep. and you know, they say you need to operate more like a business. But uh, so well, I've got 100 pages of rules that won't let me. You know. So uh, yeah, I have state. Years. I have state statute that limits me. Uh, I would love to be a benevolent dictator. Okay. I mean, I got I got all kinds of ideas. No, but okay. But I also I also believe in democracy. <laughs> And yes, sometimes those rules are limiting. There's a reason for them. I mean, you can all trust me. I'm always going to do good and do right by people, but my successor may not. And so you know, we're interested in prying them open a little bit to give us a little more responsibility, a little more flexibility, but at the same time, not just creating open season so a bad actor gets into office and, and does bad things. You know, with their, un with their unclaimed property, um, I told my chief of staff the other day, that it is the best part of my job and it's the worst part of my job. It's the part of my job that gets me the most compliments and it's the part of my job that gets me the most complaints. Because people either log in and they get money they didn't realize they had coming to them and they're happy. Or they log in, they find out that we have money, but God, I gotta send them my social security number? I gotta send them some proof that I live that address? Oh, all this work, why did you just give them my $25? People say, you make it too hard to get my money. First of all, we've gone to General Assembly, we've changed the laws to make it easier for people to get their money. But two, people have to go to some bit of work to claim their money. <coughs> because as angry as people get um, that they can't get their money very easily, you know what would make them more angry? If we gave their money to an identity thief. So we have to have some hurdles and checks in place so that we make sure we're giving the money to the right person. And I think the same thing with state laws. Are there, are there things we could change to make my job easier? Yes, certainly. But there's a give and take here. If you make it too easy, you make it really easy for your successor or some other elected official to abscond with money. So, you know, it's a balance. We try and work. I go to the General Assembly and say, this one part here, if you change it, I can earn more money mm -hmm. for you. And then I have to convince them that it's not going to result in fraud, it's not going to result in too much risk. And if you can do that, the door will pry open a little bit. If you make mistakes, the General Assembly will try and slam the door shut and make sure it never happens again. Yes? Can you share a little bit more about the ABLE program and then uh, tell me, does that apply intergenerationally? How, how do you mean intergenerationally? Well, you explain about the program and then I'll yeah. tell you. How okay, so ABLE is this great program we started up in our office. So for those who don't know, if you have someone in your life who has a, a disability, a severe disability, and they qualify for federal benefits. Those federal benefits, like SSI, SSDI, uh, are means tested. The federal government said 30, 35 years ago, you can't have more than $2,000 in assets or you lose your benefits. Okay, that number was fairly low 30 years, that number is really low today. So your, uh, let's, let's just imagine, you've got a kid with disability, they're getting federal benefits. Uh, in the middle of the pandemic, federal government sent them a check for $750. And they sent another check for $1,000. Pretty soon now they have more than $2,000 in their account and they have lost their federal benefits. What do parents do? Parents like, we're running out, like how do I spend this money? How do I spend this money? So they keep benefits coming in. And it creates some real difficult questions for parents. I talked to parents who had to, said, I had to cut my child out of my will because the $50,000 I was gonna will to them make them lose their benefits, they then would be spending all that money down in a hurry that to reapply for Social Security is not good. I talked to uh, a mother who said, my, I have a daughter who was born with cerebral palsy. She wasn't expected to live that long, but she did, she lived. She got a job working in a law firm. The law firm hired her, she would sort the mail, she'd deliver the mail, she'd do it with a smile. The lawyers liked her and said, hey, we can pay her a little more. And they called the mom and said, mom, we want to give your daughter a raise. And what did she say? Don't do it. I said, why, you don't want to have raised for your daughter? No, I do. But that little extra money is going to make it uh, so that she may um, lose her benefits, and she will lose far more than she's going to gain. Like, what kind of parent, what creates a system where a parent has to um, cut their child out of their will to take care of them, that has to tell their employer, um, don't give my kid a raise? It's a, it's a mess. Federal government in 2014 gave states the ability to create 529 savings accounts for people with disabilities, and that's what ABLE is. ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. And it allows parents to put aside money in an ABLE savings account that works an awful lot like a college savings account in that you can invest that money. The growth is tax-free as long as you use it for a disability-related expense. But the really important thing is you can save up to $100,000 in an ABLE account 
without losing your federal benefits. And that means parents can have, can leave a little something behind. I talked to a mother uh, who had a son at Choke, and she said, this is just great. This is great, like now, I, I, now, I now know when, I, when I'm gone, uh, my son can visit the dentist. She was excited about this. I said, well, I mean, he gets Medicaid, right? She does. Um, Medicaid doesn't cover uh, dental work. Medicaid will, Medicaid will cover dental emergencies. They won't cover <coughs> teeth cleanings. She said to me, like, I'm his mother. I don't need the government to pay to clean his teeth. I do that. But when I'm gone, um, who pays for that? And so what's going to happen is he's going to not have his teeth cleaned for several years, and eventually he's going to have problems, and then Medicaid's going to come in and pay for this. It makes no financial sense because the surgery is going to be very expensive. She goes, now I know I can leave enough money in Able Savings account that he can pay for his teeth cleaning. And she was happy about this, and I was struck by like, what a messed up system we have. Like a mother's just, just like worried about what happens to my kid's teeth when I die. I, mean, I, I cannot imagine anything worse in life than outliving your children. I mean, parents who have done that, like, no one expects to outlive their children. And I talked to a mother who said, I don't want to outlive my child, but I kind of hope uh, that like we die at the same time because I don't know who's going to take care of me. Because Timmy has severe autism, He's nonverbal. I'm like, I'm his primary caregiver. He gets scared around other people. What happens when I'm gone? What she said to me is like, the able account isn't going to take away all that anxiety. But it reduces my anxiety a little bit, knowing that I can leave something for him so that he's able to buy some things to bring him a little quality of life that Medicaid, that SS50, those restrictions wouldn't allow me to before. So that's what the program is. That's why it, it will transform lives. You say intergenerationally. I'm thinking of grandparents for who, who want to like invest in their grandkids. Yeah. Can they you, do the ABLE program? So they can, like a college savings fund, but I will, uh, I will direct you to my team. The federal guidelines for gifting are different for ABLE than they are for college savings. So uh, basically gift bans, I mean, gift, not gift bans, like you can gift up to a certain amount uh, into an ABLE account. And I don't know what we're up to now, like $16,000, $17,000 a year. Anything over that, you've got to pay taxes on. But um, you can't have four grandparents all gift $15,000 in their account. There are limits to what they can give. Them. So they can be helpful, um, but it's, it's similar to college savings, but it's not the same. <coughs> yes? Going back to uh, your comment about the rebate program and uh, kind of financial protection for consumers. Can you uh, speak to your the level of interaction that your office has with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau? So we Is are a cons overlap? Um, so maybe a little overlap. They are much broader. They're national. They have bigger. We get to protect consumers on uh, money that was owed to them from a corporation. Because of unclaimed property law, I can go in, I can audit their accounts for that specifically. With a little creativity, you can pried open a little bit. So when I came in, uh, I discovered there were some life insurance companies that were selling policies to people. They'd sit down at the kitchen table and say, um, what's going to happen to your spouse when you pass away? Well, I don't know. Do you know how expensive a funeral is? I have no idea. It could be five, it could be $10,000. Do you have five or $10,000 to bury you if, you if you should die? Well, no, we don't have that money laying around. Well, you're going to be a burden on your spouse then. You can't afford not to have life insurance. And people would sign up policies. And then too often, and not everyone, but too often, these companies, when their policies would pass away, made no efforts to pay out the surviving spouse. And you think, like, well, this can't be that big of a problem. Our auditors have found over $800 million in unpaid life insurance benefits. And we've returned hundreds of millions of dollars to people. And I can tell you some of my best stories as, uh, as treasurer <coughs> involved life insurance. We fought the life insurance industry. They said, we don't have to pay out. Why don't you have to pay out? Well, because it's, it's unclaimed property. They've not claimed the proceeds of the benefit. You apply to our law. I said, it's, it's not unclaimed because they haven't claimed it. Not unclaimed because they haven't claimed it. Because in their contracts they wrote in, on page uh, 5, line 14, payable upon presentation of a death certificate. Okay, so if someone didn't present a death certificate, um, well then, we don't have to pay out. 
even if the policyholder is dead. That's what they said. I don't know about you, I don't know anyone who ever bought a life insurance policy and had someone die and say, you know, I just don't want that money. I don't need it. Life insurance company can keep it. People didn't present them because they didn't know they were the beneficiaries. Now, they said, if they don't know the beneficiaries, it's their fault. So we held a bunch of hearings, invited people in. A woman came in. Um, her daughter testified that her father took out a life insurance policy, told his wife. When he died, she never claimed the money. Why not? Well, because he took out a life policy so when they were young, they lived a long life, he died. In the ensuing years, she developed Alzheimer's. So she forgot. And they said it's her fault. It's her fault she got Alzheimer's, didn't claim her money. Or uh, my other favorite one was this woman who was a single mother. She took out a life insurance policy because she's a single mother. I know if anything happens to me, my sons are going to need extra money. She took out the largest life insurance policy she could afford. She died in a car crash with her sons in the back seat. They survived, and uh, life insurance company never paid them out until our auditors went in, pried the money out, and then we were able to track them down. They were adopted by someone else. About nine years after the mother died, they got their money. Nine-year-old orphans, they said, they said it's their fault for not claiming their money. Well, I don't know what parent like sits down with their kids and says, Sally, um, if daddy dies, daddy's going to die? <laughs> no, but, but if daddy dies, you need to, what, well, daddy's going to die? Well, no, but at least explain life insurance. You don't explain this to kids. She didn't explain it to her kids. She thought someone from the insurance company would take care of her kids, and they didn't. So we got to stand up and fight, and we changed state law. So it now says if you sell a policy, it's someone in Illinois, um, you have to check and see if they've actually died. <clears throat> and you have to check twice a year. And if they have, you have to notify the beneficiaries that they're the recipients of money. And so far, no recipient has said, ah, it's okay. I don't know. Do you get interest on that? <laughs> so since we've come in, we have changed this. So we do pay interest. It's uh, defined, uh, the percentage we pay, and it's for a certain number of years we'll pay. We don't pay for 100 years. We will pay out at any time, but the interest starts being accrued at a certain point. Well, Michael, for, for students out here who might be thinking about a career in politics and government, what would you suggest to them? I mean, how did they start? How did you, what was your first campaign like? What was, uh, what was the experience of? Mine is a typical path to being state treasurer. Uh, I was a German studies major in college. Spent my summers in Eastern German studying the school, East German school system and how it changed after unification. I used that to go to Taiwan where I taught English and I studied Chinese. Uh, I used that. I came home. I worked as a paralegal in a large corporate law firm in New York. Uh, I had a fellowship in public affairs in St. Louis. Uh, I came back home. I taught at my old high school before starting an engineering company. I did that for a few years. Then I uh, became a Champaign County Auditor, State Senator, and Treasurer. It's your typical career path. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, it's a joke. That is my career path. People say, well, then, like, what do you recommend for me? Say, like, should I go live abroad? Should I go work at a law firm? I was like, you should do what <clears throat> excites you. And what interests you and what challenges you. That's the only advice I give to young people because uh, that's, that's the logic involved in my path. There was never a path to be state treasurer, I need to do this, but if you're open to experiences and you're open to challenging yourself and you're willing to take a risk to do something that you, know, you find really interesting, um, you're going to find your path. People are going to find it for you. I was talking to the group earlier today. I tell people, like, a lot of people say, you know, you need to be a lawyer. You need to be an engineer. You need to go to med school. And that may be good advice for some people, but like if you're trying to fit someone into a profession that they don't love, um, you say, like, you need to be a lawyer. And they show up and they hate the law. They hate corporate law. But they're doing it because they got all these bills to pay and because they don't want to disappoint their family. They're going to like look for reasons to show up late to work. They're going to look for reasons to leave early. They're going to hide from their colleagues because they don't want more work dumped on them. Okay. And that person is going to stay a lawyer throughout their career because no one's going to want to hire or promote them because they just look miserable. Do something you love, something that excites you, and then um, you will show up to work early. You will leave work late. You will do it with a smile and you'll ask to help other people. <laughs> you got any extra work I can help you with? And people will notice that and then um, they'll say, like, I want to promote this person. Most of my opportunities, most of my Jobs are not something I was looking for, not something I applied for, but someone saw how I was working and said, I, I like what you're doing. I think you'd be good here. You should apply for this, you should do this, or you should run for this. And so my advice for students is 
you know, you have to feed yourself. You can't just work for free all of your life. But you don't have to chase bucks. Chase your dreams, chase your passion. Be open to opportunities that come to you. Do things that excite you. And take a risk. Do something that challenges you. you know, if it doesn't challenge you, it will not change you. You will not mm -hmm. grow if you do something that comes easy to you. You know, it was, when I moved to Taiwan, I didn't speak Chinese. It was very challenging. But I learned really quickly. When I started an engineering company, I wasn't an engineer, but I saw a problem, and we hired engineers, and we figured things out, and we made mistakes. But in making mistakes, you learn a lot faster. That's my advice to, to young people looking for a career. Uh, maybe one more question, then I know you're going to have to hustle off yeah. to your plane. I wanted to ask uh, general advice for young people. What uh, financial advice do you have for us? So you can go to the Illinois Treasurer's website, and you can go to the Finwell Education Hub, and you will find a lot of information available there. Um, that sounds like a, a plug or an advertisement, and it is. <laughs> but it's also like, you know, we try to uh, be in charge of financial literacy, give people opportunities to learn. You know, financial literacy means different things. It means different things for, for kids who are like getting out of high school. Uh, for kids going to college, it's different. For seniors who are subject to scammers, it's something different. For families who are like looking to take on a mortgage, it's different. And so we have a lot of different advice out there. But like, don't be afraid of it. Don't run from it. Don't put off your financial uh, future. It's very easy to hide from your problems. Say like, oh my God, I know, I know those those letters there are a bunch of bills. I don't want to deal with them now. And I tell you, if you put them off and you put it off, um, they only get worse. You may not be able to um, pay off all of your bills at, at one time, but you got to find a plan to work to do it. And then when you have disposable income, you've got to have a plan on how you're going to grow it so you have money to retire. And these uh, don't come easy, but, uh, but don't be scared. Uh, and I do want to say thank you all very much for coming out here. I am very happy to be here. I'm very thankful to Paul Simon Institute for inviting me down here. I am thankful that Southern Illinois now has regional transportation air service. Um, I wish there were more seats. I had a flight option other than 145. But uh, my wife gave birth to uh, identical twin sons this summer. Uh, they are a handful. <laughs> they are going to be athletes. They are working in their lung capacity every day. They scream a lot. <laughs> and my wife gets very frustrated. It's like, why are you gone? <laughs> when are you going to be back? So I cannot miss the flight getting back home tonight. It's also my, I didn't leave her alone. For those who think, like, they came down here and left her alone, the two babies. I left her with my parents. My parents came up. But today is my mother's birthday as well. And so I need to get up for my mother's birthday uh, to relieve, relieve my wife. And so really, I love these conversations. I would love to come back at some time in the future. My running out of here right now is not indicative of any problem here in Southern Illinois. It's just uh, a necessity today. And uh, when Contour Airlines gets a 2.30 flight up to Chicago, I will, I will stay with her. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much.